Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to today's um, civil lecture from the Angavante IOA. So tonight we have the pleasure to welcome um, Thomas Quarup from Cope um, Architect in Copenhagen um, to give us a lecture. So Cope um, is a very prestigious architecture firm um, based in Copenhagen. It was founded in 2006 uh, by architect uh, Dan Stubergard. And then the, pro uh, the, the company is looking at um, project from the perspective from, um, of urbanism, landscape, future mobilities, etc. cetera. Um, Thomas is, um, is one of COPE's five project directors and is also part of COPE's management. He has headed a large number of COBE's most prestigious projects, including the Ragnarok Museum and Roskilde Festival Folk High School in um, Roskilde, as well as the Nord um, Station in Copenhagen and the library in Copenhagen's Northwest District. Thomas has um, knowledge and then has knowledge in terms of urbanism, as well as um, design approach from sustainability, ecology, and mobility. So tonight, he's going to bring us several exciting projects, which um, without further ado, I think everyone is very, very excited to hear about. So let's welcome Thomas for the lecture. Thank you, uh, Kyle, uh, for the uh, uh, gracious introduction. Um, very uh, honored, uh, humbled uh, to be here tonight and uh, to uh, present uh, some of Kobe's uh, projects. So um, yeah, I'm looking very much forward to just uh, go through these projects. <clears throat> As I was explaining to Maya and uh, Kyle before, I was a little bit generous with uh, the slides, so I hope uh, that I uh, don't stretch it too much, but I will try and go through in a sort of a, a nice, uh, 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 um, uh, yeah, tempo. Um, so let me just uh, begin by uh, sharing my screen. And uh, if you guys can give a thumbs up if you uh, see it. Um, okay, uh, one last thing, i just close here. Um, <clears throat> So uh, as Kyle just explained, uh, uh, Kobe is an architecture office uh, from Copenhagen and it was established in uh, 2006, found, founded by uh, Dan Stubergard. Um, 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 in, as part of our sort of uh, 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 10 year anniversary, we started uh, doing a re retrospect retrospective uh, of, uh, of uh, the history of Koba and actually the projects that we have executed in and around Copenhagen. And we started to sort of uh, group these stories into a sort of a, a larger theme to uh, that we saw arise uh, from our projects uh, in and around Copenhagen. And we uh, um, published a book uh, called Our Urban Living Room. Uh, and uh, also uh, this book uh, sort of coincided with an exhibition uh, of our urban living room, which has uh, been uh, actually also traveling um, Europe. So it was first in Copenhagen and it's also been in Finland and in uh, Berlin. Um, <clears throat> and basically the, the thought behind the book, it's a book of six chapters uh, and I will go through sort of the six themes outlined in each chapter. And it's uh, basically the knowledge that we gained while working in and around Copenhagen. Uh, and it's also sort of uh, an explanation about uh, the trajectory of Kuba. Uh, this is uh, uh, to the left, the picture of uh, the office uh, just around when I started working there. Um, where there were uh, six people working and today we are roughly around 130 people in the office. <clears throat> and uh, the book uh, also talks about all these different projects that we have uh, executed in around Copenhagen and sort of the themes that we sort of were able to sort of gather from uh, these projects. Uh, so the next two slides actually are maybe uh, the two most important slides of the, uh, the presentation because they sort of outline and explain the whole background of COBA. 
Uh, we are a multidisciplinary office, and this means that we work in urbanism, uh, public space, and architecture. And uh, the reason why we try to work in all these three different scales is that we find it extremely important to figure out the sort of cross pollinization between the different uh, fields of uh, master planning, public space, architecture, and public space, and how these things interact and inform one another. Uh, the other uh, theme uh, that's also highly important for uh, COPA as an office is that we are context driven. And that means that we work with a, an urban context, we work with a social context, and we work with the cultural context of each project that we try to, uh, to uh, that we work with. And that's, this means that we also are uh, very highly analytical in our approach to sort of uh, developing our projects. <clears throat> and uh, you could say that the, the uh, that we are sort of also uh, trying to explain through this book and our urban living room to uh, show that actually we're trying to sort of uh, create buildings and spaces that actually are for the users and not so much uh, for the architecture itself, that it becomes a sort of a framework and a backdrop to uh, people's lives. Um, and also that it, it's... Uh, uh, architecture and design that's actually intended for use and actually trying to sort of uh, blur the boundaries between uh, the public and uh, private private areas. Um, but uh, the book in itself, it's sort of uh, um, uh, uh, also explaining sort of this development of Copenhagen, uh, where you can sort of see uh, back in the day, it was a very much a car-based city. And today it's sort of renowned for being a pedestrian friendly and also a bicycle friendly city. Uh, it's a city that's uh, renowned for its livability and for uh, its liveliness uh, uh, at street level and its public spaces. But actually this was not always the case because uh, uh, during the seventies and eighties, the city was almost going bankrupt. Um, uh, the city was basically under decay uh, and falling apart. Uh, there was a huge demographic uh, crisis in the city. Um, and actually, uh, this demographic crisis was sort of um, uh, enforced by the sort of uh, the death of the industry within the city. So it became an industrial city without a city. And like many other uh, European cities, uh, became one of these post industrial cities. At the same time, there was a, an exodus uh, from the city that it lost uh, almost half of its uh, inhabitants. They uh, fled the city to the suburbs. <clears throat> uh, and actually, uh, what we found interesting is to sort of try and explain through architecture, what was it that sort of transformed this uh, situation in Copenhagen that today it's a city for people. Uh, Copenhagen has also be become um, uh, uh, renounced also the rest of Denmark, not only for its bicycle culture and its culture, but also for its uh, films, uh, its public spaces, its clean harbor, um, the Nordic food, that there's a lot of uh, different elements that sort of under uh, or undercurrents that actually enforce this. Um, and looking at the Kobe, uh, sorry, Copenhagen, uh, that uh, actually uh, comparing it to other uh, um, brandings of uh, world cities. Um, the city itself is branding itself on this sort of lifestyle um, uh, of uh, the bicycle of uh, actually having this uh, sustainable lifestyle within the city. Um, <clears throat> and you could say that the, uh, also Copenhagen, uh, its livability is its icon because uh, if you just look at the sort of these large uh, icons of the uh, different uh, world renowned cities like Paris, um, New York or London, uh, they have uh, icons and uh, maybe what we're mo most famous for is the Little Mermaid. But in fact, it's actually the livability that uh, is our icon. So um, the first uh, sort of theme uh, that I would like to go through uh, with you is uh, Copenhagen tomorrow, and it showcases the, the North Harbor. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the background for the North Harbor uh, is that, uh, um, that the urban migration in uh, Denmark is really uh, pulling through and actually Copenhagen is growing by far in its numbers. Um, <clears throat> 
And this means that actually uh, Copenhagen as a city has to sort of find space for all of its new inhabitants. Um, Copenhagen is a, a, is a port city, it's a trade city, and it's always sort of uh, had a, a strong relationship with its coastline. Uh, and its coastline has always been uh, sort of ever changing and uh, developing as the city does. Um, <clears throat> Uh, another element, uh, just going back to this idea of, of uh, the post-industrial city, is that all these uh, black spots that we've tried to sort of uh, drop into the map of uh, onto the map of Copenhagen, these are sort of old industrial areas that are abandoned, and they actually became sort of these new uh, spots uh, in the city for urban growth. Actually, that the, this, these post-industrial areas became the areas where the city could grow. So in uh, 2000 uh, and uh, um, I think it was 2009, 2010, we took part in an open international competition uh, that we won uh, for the uh, extension of uh, Copenhagen in the North Harbor. Uh, and you could say this is sort of just jumping back and forward. This is uh, just showing the extension of the city uh, into the uh, uh, Um And the North Harbor is an old trade port. Um, uh, here you can see uh, one of the historic images. It's also one of the ports that was used when uh, immigrants, they migrated to uh, the US, uh, for example, uh, shown here. Uh, today, it's uh, based on our project. It's actually one of the largest uh, land reclamation projects in, uh, in Northern Europe. <clears throat> and uh, it's basically uh, reclaiming land in uh, the sound uh, uh, which is supposed to develop over towards uh, 2050, maybe more uh, and maybe earlier or maybe later. Just uh, going through to, uh, from a sort of a, an architectural and the planning point of view, it's sort of uh, built upon sort of six quite simple uh, principles of islands, uh, cultural heritage, uh, sustaining urban green, uh, uh, working with sustainable uh, infrastructure, the green uh, city or five minute city um, with the green loop, uh, having a city on the water, and also most importantly, working with an intelligent grid. And that's sort of to say that it's a grid that can develop over time and that is not predetermined as seen in many uh, of uh, our earlier cities. <clears throat> So just going through some of these ideas of uh, creating uh, um, these islands uh, in the city, islets and neighborhoods, that each island gets its own neighborhood feel. We cut uh, the harbor and we are still doing it uh, at the moment, cutting it uh, into pieces, introducing new canals. <clears throat> these new canals, they sort of uh, break the city into pieces and they make sure that uh, you have sort of these uh, local neighborhoods where each neighborhood has its own identity um, and uh, has its own sort of architectural feel and look. Also that we sort of uh, are very uh, mindful and sort of uh, uh, want to ensure that we keep uh, the cultural heritage, the industrial heritage of the harbor, so that when you uh, go in uh, the North Harbor, that you actually feel like you uh, are in an old harbor and not in just a new uh, uh, housing neighborhood. Also that the roads are laid out in this uh, five minute city. And this means that from uh, five minutes uh, walking distance, you are within a um, uh, public uh, transport. Also that the uh, uh, bicycles are favored over cars. Um, <clears throat> also that the, the city is on the water. So the city is uh, facing the water. And we, with these new canals, you actually sort of heighten the, the livability and also sort of uh, make sure that people can easily access the water to just jump in and swim, as uh, you can see here on this image. So uh, this is just an uh, overview uh, uh, of, uh, actually it's already an outdated image of the North Harbor. Also what's interesting is this is where uh, Coop uh, has our office uh, today. We uh, are in an old warehouse, um, which we've sort of renovated and uh, actually um, we like to work with a high degree of sort of public interaction. So we've also introduced a cafe, which is unfortunately closed due to COVID-19. Uh, and inside we have our office today. 
Um, so the next theme that we wanted to uh, uh, explore that we also realized uh, while working in Copenhagen is this uh, the need for transformation uh, of buildings instead of just tearing them down, that actually uh, these built uh, warehouses, uh, old structures in, in industrial areas, they are an immense resource for the city. And we try to sort of uh, um, showcase that through a few different projects. And uh, you could say that actually this industrial decline has not only left empty uh, areas in the city, but it also left a lot of empty buildings. Uh, this is some uh, um, graffiti on one of the walls in, uh, or uh, the gables in, uh, in uh, Nørrebro, uh, which is uh, quite saying for how we would like to approach uh, this thought of actually questioning why do we tear things down instead of uh, just uh, preserving them. An example of this could be uh, uh, <clears throat> the B&W, um, not that B&W, but uh, the boat ship builders uh, from Denmark. They had their warehouses uh, on Reusselhöden. Um, this was transformed for actually a Eurovision event. Like many, many other meatpacking districts around the world, uh, also in Copenhagen, this has been uh, transformed to uh, restaurants and exhibitions. So. Um, one of the, our projects that uh, works along this theme is uh, our uh, silo project. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what's actually uh, quite magnificent about this project is that it's, it's, uh, uh, it's placed in the North Harbor uh, and uh, it's uh, an old sort of uh, 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 corn silo or grain silo. Um, and it was slated for demolition. Um, uh, and actually with, uh, you could say with um, a very uh, good client, we were able to both convince a client and also uh, uh, the Copenhagen City Port authorities that they should not tear down these uh, silos, but actually they could uh, sort of be reused as a um, something so simple as a housing project. <clears throat> Uh, the silo itself, it's actually, it's uh, by a company DLG and it's, um, you can see many of these silos sort of, uh, sort of stamped out across the country in the different harbors in Copenhagen. Um, so there's actually nothing super typical, uh, atypical about it. Uh, what we try to do is basically uh, look at it <clears throat> as uh, not only a housing project, but also a building that uh, can sort of uh, give back to Copenhagen. Uh, Copenhagen is, uh, you could say, a very flat city. We don't build high. So the possibility of adding new program, not only housing, but also a public attraction on the top so that people can go up and uh, see the skyline, actually see uh, the extents of the city uh, was quite important for us. But also how the building meets uh, <clears throat> the, the ground floor uh, how it meets uh, the public space, that it also has the possibility for uh, sort of exhibitions, so it becomes a, a, a public space activator. And then lastly, that uh, there's also a new skin added to the project. So you could say this is uh, sort of the, uh, <clears throat> the architectural design intent that we produced while designing the building. And uh, this is what it looks like uh, today. Um, so the existing building in 2010 and uh, uh, the building uh, in 2016 or when it was uh, completed. And uh, basically you could say that it's um, uh, actually a project uh, that's somehow uh, quite simple, but also super challenging at the same time of just adding uh, a new skin uh, to uh, an existing structure but also uh, sort of diving into uh, this old uh, grain silo and sort of pulling out uh, the unnecessary um, uh, um, uh, ducts and uh, um, uh, building elements and basically just cutting a hole in uh, the, the facade of the building. And actually what we try to do is to create this sort of uh, bespoke uh, apartment layouts uh, so actually have 32 uh, quite unique uh, apartments and uh, actually uh, design them uh, quite individually. So you get this almost patchwork like facade expression of uh, different heights. So on the outside the building, uh, it looks completely new with this sort of fully integrated facade system of uh, not only uh, windows, but also balconies and so forth that are integrated into one design element um, uh, overlooking the city. 
but on the inside of the building um <clears throat> you actually uh, still feel the nature of uh, of this uh grain silo that you feel this uh sort of cast concrete this is taken from uh, the exhibition area on the ground level and just as you step into the apartments you also we wanted to preserve this feeling of living within a silo so that you actually really feel the presence of the, the concrete and the concrete silo. Uh, also that uh, you have these amazing generous heights uh, as a result of uh, working within an existing structure instead of building new, just trying to, uh, trying to convince a, a, a developer to make a, a room height like this is uh, almost uh, un, uh, unthinkable. And actually, uh, the project it became uh, uh, quite popular. Uh, the Simpsons they had an episode where they visited Copenhagen, and our building got to make a small little cameo uh, where they uh, visited it. Um, <clears throat> uh, and another project that we've done uh, in uh, Roskilde is the Ragnarok uh, Museum. Originally, it was titled the Rock Museum, uh, and the Roskilde Festival Folk High School. Um, and these are two projects that we've actually. Uh, designed and completed with a uh, MBRDV in uh, Rotterdam. Um, <clears throat> uh, and it's basically uh, in an old, uh, also industrial area where they used to make concrete uh, and concrete uh, elements. And it's this notion of sort of uh, transforming an area from concrete to culture uh, production. Before we, this is an image from uh, when we actually started the competition and uh, all these. Uh, um, warehouses they were slated for demolition uh, as part of the competition brief we were told just uh, take it all down we don't need it they have no value um, <clears throat> what we try to do again is to work with a series of uh, simple design pr principles where we actually wanted to keep these um, existing halls because we saw them not only as amazing spaces uh, architectural and cultural heritage uh, but they also are the sort of uh, the uh, sort of the essence of uh, this uh, area in Roskilde. So we wanted to sort of renovate the halls. We wanted to sort of make sure that the communal area and sort of programmatic boxes were added to the halls, that they are open to the outside, and we sort of plug icons into uh, into the uh, the project. So you can say this is a, a before and after image of uh, the area and here to the bottom right you can see the <clears throat> Ragnarok uh, museum sort of towering over the halls as this sort of icon of this new uh, emerging neighborhood. <clears throat> and you could say this is a, a sort of the architect's uh, image of the building. Uh, where you see this massive uh, cantilever of uh, roughly 22 by 22 uh, meters sort of towering over not only halls, but also the red carpet that sort of leads into, uh, into the red heart of the building. And what's interesting for us is not so much what the, 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 the building looks like, but it's actually what it does. Um, one thing is this sort of amazing uh, contrast that the, this uh, glitter box has with the adjacent uh, um, uh, warehouses that you, you really sort of enforce this contrast between new and old, shiny and uh, uh, worn down. Um, <clears throat> um, and also sort of uh, the interaction between the sort of transformed halls uh, surrounding the building. But it's also uh, uh, sort of utilizing a building as uh, sort of uh, something performative that actually creates a sort of covered uh, outdoor public space that's actually used by public uh, for events, for gatherings, for concerts, and so forth under this uh, sort of quite massive uh, uh, cantilever. Inside the building, uh, we have the red carpet. It flows inward. It guides uh, visitors inside. And it can also be utilized uh, for concerts, as shown here. Uh, up inside the the golden glitter box, it's uh, it almost functions more as a black box that's uh, sort of uh, able to sort of have flexible uh, exhibitions that can change over time. Here, uh, showing one of the ex uh, exhibitions in hand. Next to uh, um, <clears throat> uh, the Rock Museum or Ragnarok, we actually have this somewhat, um, you could say, it's also a little bit of a, a generic or um, uh, um, for lack of a, a better word, it's, 
uh, almost a building you don't notice. It's also a warehouse that we've transformed for uh, a folk high school. And a folk high school is a, a, a school that you go to uh, usually after you complete uh, high school. Uh, it's called adult education and it's school uh, with a dormitory where you stay at the school for roughly six months at a time. Um, and the school is uh, um, sort of uh, connected to the Roskilde Festival. It's called the Roskilde Festival Folk High School. And we uh, transformed uh, uh, this uh, warehouse into a, a school project where we try to sort of work with a very simple box in a box uh, principle, um, where each classroom uh, became, uh, you could say, a programmatic box. And each box gets a, a unique color and also materiality uh, to sort of uh, not only to uh, explain a little bit about the function inside of the box, uh, but also to create this sort of playful nature. <clears throat> and uh, the in the heart of the building, uh, you have sort of this open street with the colonnade of, uh, of the existing warehouse uh, and uh, the um, school boxes to the side stacked one on top of each other in two layers. And uh, each uh, box, uh, as I mentioned before, they have uh, different programs and different functions. And this is also why they have a different color scheme. For example, this yellow box is the dance studio. Uh, the checkered box to the top left is the music studio and the orange box is sort of the main gathering space. And the orange is because uh, it's the same color as uh, the Roskilde Festival's color. Um, what also happens is you have a lot of in-between spaces because of this box in a box principle that becomes sort of in work, informal, um, informal uh, <clears throat> workspaces and gathering spaces. Inside of one of the boxes, you have a wood workshop where students can build uh, and design elements and uh, sort of uh, produce them. Uh, <clears throat> uh, there's a music studio uh, also inside one of the boxes and also one of the main auditoriums in this sort of uh, orange uh, flavor. And, uh, uh, and at night, uh, what's nice is when the lights are turned on in the school, it uh, turns from this little bit bland uh, um, um, uh, gray uh, warehouse and it becomes colorful because of all the colors within the building, which is quite nice that you actually, uh, it transforms itself uh, from day to night. The next project uh, that I wanted to show to you is the Paper Island, um, which is in the, the heart uh, of Copenhagen. Uh, and it's actually an old island that was closed off uh, to the public uh, for more than 250 years. Uh, first, because it was a naval base, a uh, naval military base. And then afterwards, it was actually um, uh, used for storing paper uh, rolls for the um, printed press. Uh, so this means that the, no, uh, uh, but he used the space and it was sort of a forgotten area in the heart of Copenhagen. Um, and actually uh, we, uh, before uh, working on this project, we were working alongside the client to sort of help program the area. And it became actually one of these sort of quite amazing new public attractions because people were finally able to uh, uh, enter the, um, the paper island. Um, the halls were quickly transformed, not only for uh, sort of these uh, <clears throat> uh, food uh, uh, trucks uh, used for um, a street food area, but there was also art galleries. There was um, a science uh, museum in one of the halls. Uh, you, the area was also used for this sort of incubator um, area for young uh, offices. And actually, we also had our uh, office on the island. So this is, was uh, where what our office looked like before we uh, uh, moved in and actually after we moved in. <clears throat> so we, uh, are, we were very uh, well familiar with the area when we started uh, working on the competition for the, uh, um, for the paper island. So there was a, a international uh, uh, design competition held for the paper island. And uh, this is uh, sort of the, um, you could say the updated proposal that won and that, that is actually gonna be built. Uh, so we de designed the master plan uh, of uh, the site. Uh, just a small disclaimer, I will also show that later, but uh, afterwards there was a subsequent, subsequent um, a competition held for the site. Uh, for the water culture house here on the corner. Uh, it was won by uh, Kingo Kuma. 
uh, who's uh, building that. <clears throat> One of the main themes uh, th that we uh, wanted to do is to sort of keep the existing halls uh, we weren't able to, so we tried to, to actually redesign them and create new halls um, so that actually the life that was already there and emerged on this island can sort of come back uh, once it is um, uh, built again. So you could say that actually uh, the uh, the project is uh, in this section, you can see it's uh, a series of halls with uh, very basic uh, housing on tops. And it's not just one type of uh, sort of luxury housing, but it's also uh, mixed in with affordable housing projects. And uh, <clears throat> the typology for, for the project was basically uh, working with a series of stacking of warehouses where we have uh, the uh, sort of historic warehouses uh, Pakhus from uh, Copenhagen stacked on top of uh, more contemporary warehouses that create this sort of um, this sort of uh, architectural um, typology. Um, <clears throat> another thing that uh, was sort of decisive for the project is sort of this uh, you could call it a parametric input or. There's two uh, elements that are important in Denmark. Uh, um, one is the, the sun and the other is the wind. Uh, we don't have so much sun uh, during the winter. And uh, when we have sun during the summer, uh, um, uh, we really like uh, being outside. Uh, the winters are dark and the summers are overly uh, bright uh, when it's not raining, of course. And the other thing is that we actually have a, a, a lot of wind. It's a windy city. And this means that uh, in order to make the most out of the public spaces, the, the buildings were also designed accordingly. And this means that actually we try to sort of work with a, what we call a blue outside, which is a, a promenade of public spaces that's facing the blue water of the harbor, <clears throat> and a green side with a sort of a, the inside of the um, of the um, the project where you actually have this sort of uh, layered green gardens for the people who live there on top of the halls. So you have a, um, a green heart. Uh, and then uh, also we have these uh, sort of uh, uh, public space that's in the heart of the, the project with uh, the warehouses that are uh, going to be uh, recreated uh, at ground level. Uh, <clears throat> again, here you can sort of see um, uh, a profile uh, of the project just uh, uh, from the other side of the harbor where you actually sort of see the characteristic uh, design of the uh, the profile of the building that are sort of extruded, um, uh, creating this uh, project. And here to the left, you see uh, Kingo uh, Kuma's uh, water culture house. And uh, this is uh, something that's currently uh, being built. And uh, here it's actually uh, an image that's also a little bit uh, dated because they're already progressing quite quickly. Here they're excavating for the uh, underground parking. Um, <clears throat> The next thing, theme that we sort of uh, stumbled upon in uh, in uh, in uh, working on our projects in uh, Copenhagen is this notion of uh, inclusivity. Uh, it's a theme that's often come up uh, when working with projects, and there's many ways to sort of discuss what is uh, inclusivity in uh, design and uh, uh, design processes. And actually, what we sort of learned was this uh, architectural democracy, we called it. Uh, and that's to sort of say, what if architecture is not just designed by the architects, but it's also designed by the people who uh, are going to live in it and also people who are gonna look at it on an everyday basis. To just give a little bit of a background on this, <clears throat> uh, you can sort of uh, look at this map of Copenhagen and it's, uh, uh, we're not a big city, but still it's uh, subdivided in a, a number of different uh, um, uh, districts. And each district has a sort of a local um, uh, a planning authority and also, a, a, you could say, a, a, a local uh, community that you can uh, uh, connect to. And as sort of part of all uh, planning and approval processes of, uh, uh, of any project that has to be built in, uh, in, uh, in the city and also in Denmark, you have to have a local plan, which creates the sort of zoning law for each individual project. And there's sort of a series of processes that you have to go through and in order to sort of get the zoning. Of course, you have to request that there's a dialogue with uh, the municipality. But then once uh, there is a sort of a proposal uh, sent out, it has to go to a public hearing. 
and actually there's a, a lot of a sort of development of the project because the public hearing has a huge impact on uh, on sort of um, the final uh, local plan and zoning laws. Um, <clears throat> just to give an example of this, uh, I, I can't uh, remember the year for it, but actually for, for a while they were, when uh, cars were in the, uh, the uh, sort of this idea of a car city and uh, sort of living in the suburbs was a, at its biggest. There was a plan made uh, put forward to actually remove the lakes and to have this sort of eight way uh, eight lane highway cut through the city uh, instead of having uh, the lakes here, which is sort of one of the main uh, sort of you could call um, green icons or water icons of the city. But actually doing th through this hearing uh, process, it was rejected. And luckily so, because it is one of the most uh, favored uh, public spaces in the city. And this is actually sort of touching upon something that we noticed uh, working in Copenhagen, is that actually the role of the architect today is more uh, transforming from a sort of this artist idea that you have seen from uh, um, an older generation of architects uh, uh, of um, where you actually go from being an artist to be more a mediator and a curator that actually sort of tries to facilitate processes and help um, <clears throat> Uh, develop uh, projects rather than just push one uh, agenda or design. So an example of that is uh, uh, where uh, you could say this sort of inclusive idea of a uh, dialogue as a design parameter was sort of a key element. Um, Kreuz uh, Ples is sort of a, we call it an architectural battlefield. Um, uh, and it's because that the, uh, there's been so many projects that have been put forward uh, to it. It's in the historic part of uh, Copenhagen. Uh, Erik van Egerat in the, out of the, the Netherlands, he won a competition. It was rejected. Uh, big uh, 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 Björg Engels group made a proposal for it. Henning Larsen Architects also made a proposal for it and they were all rejected. <clears throat> so um, we were sort of uh, put into this uh, role of seeing if we could uh, solve problems. Um, uh, here, the white line is sort of sh uh, showing uh, actually the, the placement of a Kreuz Ples. And actually what you see here is that you have a perpendicular to a lot uh, to the waterfront is these warehouses that sort of uh, uh, line uh, the length of uh, the inner harbor of Copenhagen. And you could say this is actually one of the most historic uh, parts of this uh, inner harbor. Uh, the other uh, sort of important element of uh, Copenhagen is that uh, Copenhagen uh, is not famous for its high rises. We have a few uh, underway, but it's actually um, uh, more known for its sort of church towers and spires on buildings uh, and clock towers, where we actually have more than 500 in the Copenhagen area. And these are actually quite important just uh, when you start designing uh, buildings in the, in the historic part of the, the context. So uh, <clears throat> just looking at this sort of idea of uh, utilizing the uh, dialogue as a design pr parameter, there was a lot of input from numerous sort of um, public hearings and public consultation meetings uh, that actually were collected and put into the project. So uh, this is what the, the, the project uh, looks like today, um, with, which is sort of comprised of uh, these three uh, buildings, two perpendicular to the water, uh, one um, parallel uh, to the uh, waterfront. And actually you can sort of see how the building is uh, on one hand, it's um, uh, reacting very strongly to the context, uh, sort of uh, folding to make sure that sight lines are pre preserved. Um, but also uh, uh, actually sort of uh, giving a sort of a new reinterpretation to uh, uh, these, uh, this warehouse typology. The project is sort of, uh, has, um, again, we like to have a sort of very clear sort of dogmatic, diagrammatic approaches to a project. And it's basically uh, these four uh, simple uh, diagrams that sort of guided the design. The first being that we sort of work with the sort of the warehouse uh, uh, alignment of, uh, of uh, the harbor where uh, the two of which are sort of uh, <clears throat> perpendicular to the waterfront, one is uh, parallel. The other is that we have to be sure that we sort of 
we don't that we don't just take space uh, from the citizens of the area, but we actually give public space back. So we make sure that we actually continue the harbor prom promenade and that there's also public space, uh, that the ground floor is animated. Uh, and most importantly, that we are able to sort of mold and uh, develop the, uh, the building heights and the geometry of the building so that they actually meet uh, the adjacent building. So you sort of feel like that the building itself is clicking into the context. So here you can uh, sort of in this image see um, how the the building is sort of continuing this uh, sort of warehouse lineage moving down the harbor front. Uh, there's a promenade uh, sort of lining the building. Uh, the building is also cut through different areas so people uh, can just uh, walk through the development. It's not something that's concealing the uh, waterfront, but it's actually inviting you to sort of go in and, and, and use uh, the harbor front. The building heights, they sort of go down and meet uh, the parapet heights of the existing buildings so that actually the heights are matching to the uh, uh, adjacent context. Uh, the ground floor is uh, <clears throat> open and uh, public with different programs, uh, cafes, restaurants, um, uh, uh, sort of lining the space so that actually you create this sort of a ground floor animation and help activate the public space instead of just making uh, uh, what might just be a, a dead uh, housing facade that uh, maybe colonizes the space instead of invites people to use it more. Just uh, working on the facade design, the, the aim was also to sort of take our, our sort of themes and cues from the existing um, warehouse typologies, this historic warehouse, a pack house typologies of uh, the Copenhagen Harbor front, and actually sort of use, utilize it with this sort of idea of having a base, a mid range of the building, and also having a roofscape. Uh, <clears throat> what's also quite, uh, uh, sort of, you could say, quite um, prominent is this idea of wrapping the building, that we don't have uh, two different types of sap material, but we actually have this terracotta shingle that that wraps up around the roof and sort of uh, completely um, uh, creates this uh, uh, immersed building. Uh, but also uh, uh, the other uh, one where we use a normal brick, we also try to, we actually, uh, we turn the brick 90 degrees. So this is actually would have been the bottom sign of a brick. They're sort of turned 90 degrees and it gives this sort of textured uh, um, uh, feeling of the building. And on the inside, of course, you have uh, houses that are sort of working with this sort of uh, um, interesting uh, um, um, roof geometry. <clears throat> so um, uh, an another theme that we were sort of, uh, sort of discovering uh, working uh, with our public space projects is actually that there is this uh, huge mov movement in the city to sort of transform uh, infrastructural space to public space. Uh, and it's it's also a, a question of a, something that I think many other cities, uh, many more car-based cities in the past Corona and COVID-19 uh, pandemic, they've sort of also started questioning is like, why does uh, infrastructure dictate the vast majority of our public spaces in our cities? Uh, as I mentioned before, the, the bicycle is sort of the logo of the city and it's, it's um, it's not just a logo for a bicycle, but it's also a logo for this notion of livability and how the bicycle is a, a, a symbol for this new uh, idea of uh, having a sustainable, uh, 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 livable um, way of living within an urban area. And uh, there have been numerous projects built in Copenhagen, uh, just uh, sort of enhancing uh, the bicycle experience. This is a, a bicycle uh, bridge that's sort of uh, snaking its way through uh, the city and also the harbor front. Uh, and it, it is quite important because the bicycle is um, actually a, a huge, uh, um, a useful, uh, um, sustainable uh, transportation um, vehicle, so to say, but it's actually basically everybody uses it in the city, uh, whether it rains, snows, uh, like here in the image. And what you also see is that uh, bicycle traffic <clears throat> is on the rise. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you can also say that actually sort of over the development of Copenhagen, historically, there were actually lots of bicycles in the city. But as uh, uh, 
uh, people started moving outside of the city, you started seeing more and more cars, car parking spaces in the, in the city. This is actually two of the historic plazas within Copenhagen that were just plastered full of uh, car parks. Uh, and what you slowly started seeing in the 80s is that actually bicycles, they started reclaiming the, the streets again. Also, the, the city of Copenhagen has actively been uh, uh, strategically looking at how to sort of re-deploy um, uh, sort of uh, the areas of the streets. This is uh, uh, Queen, uh, Queen Louise's bridge. Uh, it's actually one of the most popular bridges today. Uh, and in the 80s, uh, there was basically, um, uh, I think maybe 20% uh, of the space was um, uh, able to be used for pedestrians. Uh, there were cars, there were trams, buses. And today you could sort of say that actually this has been sort of inverted, that now there's a more space for bicycles and for pedestrians and it, it's actually become one of the most active uh, public spaces in the city which you can sort of see here on this image where before it was basically a pure infrastructure with cars and buses and also at one point trams uh, um, one of our projects Nurport, uh, that where we've tried to uh, work with that is uh, the transformation of uh, um, uh, a public space uh, uh, where we uh, won uh, the international competition to transform this um, uh, public space on top of a Nurport station. Um, <clears throat> to give a little bit of a, a context, uh, it's, uh, it's one of the busiest stations in Denmark with more than a, a quarter of a million people passing by every day. There's uh, this map to the right, it shows just the bicycle activity in the city. So if you're crossing the city, most likely you will uh, uh, be at the epicenter with uh, roughly 20,000 bicycles uh, crossing through every day. Uh, Nurport is uh, also one of the uh, first uh, uh, train stations that were dug down, uh, that was dug down under the gr uh, ground and where you actually have an underground uh, passage or train station and trains go running underground. And actually there was built this very nice public space uh, on top with uh, bicycles um, uh, moving through and it's actually a, um, a nice plaza. But basically, um, uh, the the over time Nurport it uh, got more and more congested. It became uh, a chaos, chaos. There were bicycles stacked everywhere. It was hard to get by, and it was basically not a nice uh, area to uh, go through. And people tried to avoid it. The so this is actually the uh, the old train train station. And this image it's it's quite uh, profound uh, for two reasons. One, you can sort of see how, oh. Sorry, you can see how the uh, um, the uh, the train station is lined with uh, roads on both sides, um, uh, and basically there's hardly any public space. Uh, it's uh, completely congested with bicycle parking. The other thing that makes it actually profound is actually here in the snow image. You can sort of see how people are, are using the space, how people are moving through it. Um, and you could say this was actually the starting point for our design uh, proposal is to sort of map out um, the movement uh, of uh, people through the area. Because one thing we couldn't do was that we couldn't move the existing stairs to the underground uh, train station because the station was already there. But uh, and the 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 city blocks were there. So the mo movement of the people would somehow still be the same. And actually what we saw emerging from this pattern is uh, a series of islands, uh, spots uh, where people uh, didn't go. Uh, and actually we tried to utilize these to place actually new bicycle parkings to sort of bunch them together in these sort of uh, bicycle islands or bicycle beds that we call them. But also if we had to add buildings uh, like these oval shapes, they can be placed also in areas where people don't walk. <clears throat> and uh, here you see the uh, Nurport from a, a, an, uh, an aerial view where you can sort of see uh, the roofs uh, of the marking, um, not only the entrances to train station, but, uh, but also buildings. Uh, they're also creating covered bicycle parkings. And you can also see the other bicycle beds sort of stamped out across uh, the site. And actually what uh, we 
did, which is a, a very simple um, sort of, uh, you could sort of say a design element by grouping the bicycle beds was that we uh, pushed it down uh, roughly 30, 40 centimeters. And this means that the, the bikes are sort of aligned and structured in a very uh, clear grid. And this means that you can easily get an overview of the, uh, the bicycles. Also, we designed a, a bicycle stand that actually meant that we can pack uh, the bikes even tighter than before, and we can have more bikes on a smaller area. So uh, just to here, you can sort of see how the, the bicycle beds are sort of, uh, sort of pushed down and people actually can flow around uh, the bicycle beds without uh, it um, uh, sort of uh, uh, stepping in their way. Also here, the, the here you can see the the roofs uh, of the the accesses to the train station. They also have sort of the same shaping of the bicycle beds, and they give this sort of uh, strong contrast to the sort of this more uh, rigid block system of the city, and actually how they sort of uh, <clears throat> uh, mimic the geometry and uh, the architecture of the bicycle beds, but they're sort of floating in the air, creating these coverings over the public space. Right next to it, we have Israel's Pless, which uh, uh, we call uh, Copenhagen's biggest urban carpet. Israel's Pless is actually uh, one of the uh, largest public spaces in, in Copenhagen. Um, and it's actually on the old fortification line of uh, Copenhagen. Here you can see a small piece of the old fortification, which still exists. So it's actually uh, on the neighbor of Ørstedsparken, uh, which um, it's, uh, uh, you can almost see is uh, spilling over onto the public area. And actually, this is also a, a plaza which was once used by cars. It was a parking area. And basically, by um, having and uh, something as simple as underground parking, uh, you've actually created a uh, urban carpet with the uh, potential of having uh, uh, more than 5 million yearly visitors. This is, uh, became a sort of an immensely um, uh, popular public space because uh, there aren't many uh, uh, large scale public spaces in the heart of Copenhagen. We also like to call this uh, a democratic uh, public space. You can see, uh, uh, the guy here sitting uh, drinking his beer, he's a completely uh, different uh, 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 person than the family sitting here eating their dinner. You have uh, young kids here who um, are playing basketball in the basketball courts. So it's a, 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 a public space for all. Um, <clears throat> and uh, sort of using the uh, euphemism of sweeping something underneath the carpet, this was also the idea of um, of this where you actually have uh, a public uh, space that sort of covers the public garden. <clears throat> also, uh, the space is sort of molded up and down to create sort of these urban uh, tribunes where people can sit and overlook. You have a skateboard park uh, on it, also a basketball cart uh, park uh, on it, uh, and it's sort of lining the green um, Astas Park. Here you can see the uh, urban carpet from above, uh, just uh, stamping it out, transforming it into a drawing. You can see this, um, not only the, uh, the, uh, the carpet itself, but uh, where we've stamped out for trees and public spaces and also for um, um, skateboard parks and these uh, urban tribunes and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, as cities grow, uh, one of uh, the most important things in order to sort of create this uh, livable city and to create this welfare city is uh, to ensure that we also have enough space uh, for our kids. Uh, and you can say for children to design for them, it's it's uh, super difficult because it's uh, it's uh, uh, youngsters with uh, you could say out a, without a voice, without a, a, the ability to explain what their needs, and this is why uh, it's important to sort of uh, try to sort of put on your uh, sort of kids cap, cap so to say, and sort of try to think how would you design for children. Um, as you can say, as uh, kids are sort of going away from the suburbanization sub and going back to the kid urbanization, uh, there's many more uh, kids in the city. Uh, and in order to have this sort of strong welfare state, uh, this also means that the uh, kids, uh, they should uh, be, have the possibility to go to daycare. 
And just uh, looking at this over time, the daycare has sort of transformed uh, itself from something that's super rigid to school-like. And as you go to the 60s, it becomes more and more um, uh, in eye level, so to say, to today where uh, both adults and kids in the daycare, they sit together, they play together, they learn together. <clears throat> and uh, not only do kids uh, not have uh, a voice to sort of uh, explain about their needs, but uh, also they spend a lot of time in, a, in a Danish daycares. During a, a typical work week, they spend more waking hours uh, in a daycare than they do at home. So this is why it's important to design with care to ensure that they also get a home while they're away from home. Uh, yes, uh, the growing kids of Copenhagen. So I, I just wanted to sort of show two examples of how we've tried to uh, work with this approach of uh, designing uh, for kids. Uh, the first is Smørblomsten, uh, which is basically this small little village uh, uh, put together mainly of uh, 11 small houses um, where you have um, uh, in principle um, a system of actually having a, a white building here and it's surrounded by uh, black uh, buildings. And the white ones are actually sort of these uh, double high, triple high atriums that interconnect um, uh, these um, spaces. As the city grows, the, it has to sort of have more and more kids in uh, larger daycares uh, and the daycares are on smaller sites. So this means that uh, actually trying to work with this design and to ensure that there's not only a good indoor spaces, but we also have to make sure that there's uh, outdoor spaces that can be easily accessed from in the inside. So you have outdoor spaces in these pergolas. Uh, this is a taken an image taken before the site works were, was completed in the sort of the garden and play area was completed. And you could say that this is, is basically uh, as simple as a kid drawing. This is a, a drawing uh, that uh, actually a, a kid uh, made as part of the design process. And you could sort of say that this is the aim of the project to have something that's as simple and as icono iconographic as a, a kid's drawing, just so that you're able to communicate on the level of children. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the, the scales of uh, the kindergartens, they've grown. Uh, and they've gone from having like the smaller uh, kindergartens of uh, almost 40 kids and the, to this one, which is basically having um, almost 200 uh, kids in it. Uh, and the idea is to sort of work with uh, breaking down the, uh, the building uh, and uh, scaling it down, making sure it clicks into the context uh, and it doesn't appear like a, a, a big factory. This is one of these uh, triple high atrium spaces where you can sort of see how the motif of the house is sort of going through uh, the design uh, inside the atrium. Also, there's sort of a small uh, houses within houses uh, where you can have a small kitchen. There are also bathrooms. Also the kids, when they take their nap, they get a, their own little uh, small house where they sleep within. Um, <clears throat> another kindergarten that we worked with is uh, Fetterhusen which is, uh, you could say, almost like uh, this uh, hand drawing of uh, some uh, uh, flower pots, um, uh, where we actually try to uh, sort of um, design the building uh, like uh, this flower pot. Um, it's uh, a building that's placed in a, um, an area where they, the urban law says that you're only allowed to use red uh, brick as part of the master plan. Uh, so we try to reinterpret this and to give us sort of a contemporary expression of this red brick and try to work with this, uh, these red uh, terracotta, uh, there we call them uh, uh, terracotta baguettes, which are these extruded profiles that are burnt exactly the same way as brick are, but they're uh, industrial machined. And here, it, it's basically a, a, a daycare that has roughly the same size as um, as the small blumps in the kindergarten that I showed before, but uh, it's uh, stepping down to meet the context. It's uh, it's uh, also broken down into smaller pieces. Um, and also what we try to do is to sort of create a, a sort of a, a design of having a sort of a continuous line of these uh, terracotta baguettes that actually sort of go around and embrace the whole uh, building. And uh, 
uh, create a, a very sort of gentle uh, fencing to the area so uh, kids don't run away. Uh, so the 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 architectural facade element it also becomes uh, a sort of a completely uh, fully integrated element that not only is the facade element but it's also sort of used for the balustrade it's used for the fencing and so forth so it's wrapping in and round in and out to create a, an entrance it's covering some um, um, uh, what do you call storage facilities but it's also the daycare itself as you go out so. Um, the the last uh, theme that I wanted to uh, share with you is uh, is uh, this notion of culture as a social engine and actually how uh, cultural buildings they're actually used to um, not only uh, for livability but also they're used strate strategically to sort of enhance uh, urban areas because uh, actually they are quite significant. Um, we asked ourselves this question, what happens if the library is an important social, uh, democratic and cultu cultural institution? Because you could sort of say like, if you go back to one of these classic uh, Renaissance uh, uh, or his, uh, neoclassic uh, uh, libraries, there are amazing bookstore spaces. But if you step into a, a modern library, uh, what you see is that many of these libraries are getting rid of their books. Uh, because there, first of all, there's too many of them, and there, uh, the longevity of each book is sort of decaying, and also because of the digital presence. So just um, <clears throat> uh, looking into sort of a, a, a very simple uh, sort of development of the library, you can sort of say how the library has gone from a, a basically a monofunctional storage container um, to uh, a um, uh, this sort of more classic public library where you have a, a public library, you have a book area, there's spaces for education and uh, you go, you read a book and you leave again to what actually you see um, now is how the library, it's catering to many different elements. It, it's not only about reading books, it's about um, uh, having newspapers from uh, all over the world. There's uh, access to the internet, there's knowledge sharing, uh, there's cafes, maker spaces. Uh, there's areas for um, for meetings and cultural activities, uh, for hobbies and so forth, and cinema. And it's actually showing how actually these libraries they're transforming into these urban uh, living rooms. Um, <clears throat> and you could sort of say, just going back historically, how in ancient Greek cities, uh, the uh, the Greeks they had uh, uh, the uh, the agora as this sort of meeting uh, place, which was somehow in the center of the city and accessible from every city. Um, so historically, it's also uh, something that's actually been used a lot. So the first uh, project uh, just uh, I wanted to share is the culture Kulturus um, uh, or the library in Northwest. It's this cultural beacon, and uh, basically when we uh, did the competition, it, it's um, uh, a series of uh, four uh, stacked books. This was our idea, having uh, four uniquely stacked books uh, that create four unique worlds that you can step into. Like when you read a book, you step into a world. Uh, um, um, the library in the uh, Northwest is uh, uh, placed uh, uh, in the uh, Northwest Mount, and it's actually an area that's renowned for its uh, diversity. It's multi-ethnic. Uh, 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 it has a, a very uh, uh, many different types of building typologies. There's all, um, a lot of um, um, I, I don't want to call it uh, industry, but uh, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> office spaces, uh, social housing and so forth. So there's really this strong uh, mix of uh, program. Uh, also, it's uh, situated on top of a small hill. We don't have so many hills in Copenhagen, but this is one of them where actually here you see uh, uh, the culture house. Um, <clears throat> Uh, basically, um, the, the idea for the culture house uh, and library was uh, these uh, stacked books. Programmatically, it was a, an extension of an existing culture house with cultural programs uh, and uh, also um, a, a new library. And it's actually uh, basically stacking these sort of four boxes 
And uh, what we try to do is to create this uh, access or street uh, in between the, uh, the old uh, existing building and the, the new extension. So <clears throat> when you uh, pass by, this is uh, the, the um, building you see with these sort of four stack boxes and the spaces in between and also a rooftop terrace and actually this uh, new uh, public uh, space uh, surrounding the building. Um, uh, and it's a, a quite a bold design with this sort of uh, four uh, stack boxes. But uh, when you uh, enter the building from the backside, you actually see that these sort of four back uh, stack boxes, they actually create something quite uh, unique. Uh, there's this road uh, or street, we like to call it on the uh, backside. Uh, where uh, people can enter the building and they can either go up into the library and uh, walk around. They can also, via bridges, enter the old building. But uh, the boxes, as they shift, they create these terraces on the inside that you you use for um, different uh, spaces and programs, sitting areas where you can sit and read a newspaper. Um, this is also with civic functions, so you can also uh, get uh, your passport renewed and a new driver's license, um, besides also these different cultural uh, functions. Within each uh, box, you have a different program. Uh, the ground floor, there's the children's, children's library. Uh, on the first floor, you have the youth library. Uh, on the second floor, um, uh, the adult library. Uh, and on the top floor, we have this um, multifunctional hall, which can both be used for events, for concerts and whatnot. And actually, what's nice is that you uh, get a nice view uh, on top of uh, uh, Copenhagen looking over the roofs. Here you can see uh, <clears throat> within the kids library, uh, it's designed colorful with these stacked boxes where kids can sort of open boxes and uh, discover books and uh, and uh, sit and read uh, wherever they want to. Um, uh, another uh, library that uh, was uh, recently completed is uh, Tinkbit Library. Um, uh, and uh, just very quickly jumping into sort of the design of the building, it's basically set as a sort of a, a, a type case um, where you can sort of showcase all the different functions that are going on on the inside. Um, Tingbia is, uh, you could sort of say, it, it, it's a modernistic extension uh, to Copenhagen. So it's on the outskirts of Copenhagen and it's actually uh, designed, you could sort of say, or laid out uh, like an island within green. There's only one road uh, going in and out of Tingbia, um, so there's one access point. It's uh, a plan designed and built by uh, a, a, a famous Danish architect, Steen Eiler Rasmussen, and the landscape is done by a famous uh, Danish uh, landscape architect, Sito uh, Sørensen. And what characterizes this area is that it's all built in yellow brick, um, um, uh, with uh, sort of uh, uh, three-story buildings, some are two, uh, and there's these quite generous green areas within it. Um, and actually, it's uh, it's all social uh, housing, so it's actually been an area with a lot of uh, trouble. And the city um, proposed a, um, a library slash culture house as this new sort of uh, social engine for the area to help spark uh, transformation uh, of uh, Tingbia. Here you can sort of see um, uh, the uh, building. It uh, looks like a very uh, sort of uh, thin, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, almost old fashioned TV. And it stands out quite prominently uh, over these, these existing uh, three story and two story buildings. Um, and that's because we really wanted it to uh, stand out uh, in its uh, context. One thing that uh, you could say characterizes uh, Tingbia is that uh, it, it, no matter what building you look at, either the housing or, or the schools, uh, this, uh, this is actually Tingbia School, which is sort of the heart of the neighborhood. They have uh, all pronounced uh, sort of inclinations on the roof. Um, here uh, in the top right, you actually see the sports hall in the school. This is actually a small swimming hall in, in the school. So each time there was a special program, uh, there was also sort of a special roof design. 
And basically what we try to do is to sort of utilize these sort of three, uh, three uh, main elements of having a, a type case uh, uh, when there's a sort of a pronounced um, uh, program or function, it also has a pronounced shape. So we, we created this quite um, radical um, shaped uh, roof that uh, you could say uh, from one side, it has this framed uh, look of a, a type case and it looks like a, a super thin building. Uh, it's uh, one and a half meters uh, on its widest. Um, <clears throat> and it uh, clearly stands out from its neighbors height wise. So uh, from uh, the front, the building looks flat. You can see the different programs inside, but as you sort of step around, you can uh, the building, you can sort of see that it has this, uh, sort of inclination of the roof, it, uh, but also in plan, it has this funnel shape. Uh, at its narrowest point, it's one and a half meters, and then it sort of steps down from 20 meters height down to the three meters height. Um, um, like with uh, uh, for Feta, who so we wanted to uh, work with uh, a uh, uh, sort of a uh, a materiality that uh, refers to the existing one. So we also tried to uh, develop this project with um, uh, terracotta baguettes, but this time we worked with yellow ones where they have a sort of a different, um, uh, you could say the, they're burnt a little bit differently. So you can actually see like with a brick, normal brick building, the terracotta, it actually uh, sort of has these different uh, uh, flares of uh, color. <clears throat> um, and the terracotta, it's actually uh, creating, uh, um, it's wrapping both roof, the roof and also the sides of the building. And it's, um, it's creating this frame uh, that's actually sort of encasing the type case. When we uh, work with uh, uh, um, our projects, we like to sort of use a model of uh, standing out and fitting it at the same time that on one hand, it's very contextual, but on the same, time it should stand out. This is a, a project that we really find sort of a, a sort of both uh, fits in and stands out at the same time. Um, uh, here you can sort of see the uh, the landscape, how it's sort of stepping up. Uh, also how the facade is sort of wrapping around the landscape um, molded to it. Uh, this can be used uh, for uh, talking events. This is actually um, um, the chair of the board of the um, library giving the uh, inaugural speech of uh, the library. Uh, on the outside, uh, we have these tile baguettes, but then on the inside, we wanted to mimic this so it looks like one shell. But instead of using terracotta on the inside, we used uh, wood, but uh, actually it's very simple, uh, cheap plywood. Uh, on the outside, you get this uh, warm feeling. On the inside, you get the, uh, the warm feeling of the wood. Uh, <clears throat> the roof is sort of uh, um, angling down and you actually have a sort of a staggering floor plate that gets uh, smaller the higher you, you go up in the building. So uh, as you st the first thing you do when you step into the building, you're met by um, the event space that's uh, going down and you have this sort of almost landscape-like feel of, uh, of these different floor plates that go up. Um, here you can see how the, uh, the um, uh, <clears throat> multifunctional space is sort of stepping down um, and it's actually adjacent to the school. So this is actually used as an extension of the school. Here some kids are giving uh, speeches to one another or practicing some uh, songs. Um, uh, the balustrades are with, uh, made designed with this sort of massive plywood. So it gives like this very closed feel that you look up. Here you see the underside of the roof. Uh, um, uh, also how the design of the different elements are utilized and made playful for the kids. And as you go up, uh, you can actually see how um, these closed balustrades, they're actually used for study areas where you can sit along the edge and sit and study and you can look down. Um, as you go up in the building, uh, you actually get an amazing view all over Tinkbeer, but also almost uh, over Copenhagen because you're quite high compared to the uh, uh, adjacent buildings uh, here in the sort of uh, fall uh, daylight. Yeah, and here you can sort of see the building from the outside just uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, um, from the streetscape. So um, 
the last project I, I wanted to share with you is uh, uh, Adidas uh, Halftime. Um, and you could sort of say it's all not only a social engine, but it's also it's showcasing a little bit um, uh, uh, the knowledge that we uh, got from Copenhagen and our Copenhagen projects and how we sort of try to utilize this knowledge and work uh, in a foreign context. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Adidas is uh, founded by Adidasla, and he actually has these. Uh, the Adidas is, of course, famous because of its three stripes. But uh, if any of you have had a pair of Adidas, then and you zoom in a little bit to um, the stripes, you actually see that they have this very uh, elegant sawtooth profile, and then there's a sew stripe on the inside. So there's actually a, a lot of detail in just these very simple three stripes of, of Adidas. Uh, we took part in a in a, a international uh, competition uh, a, um, for the development of a new uh, uh, um, uh, open building. It's it, it was to be placed on the Adidas campus, uh, and with as with many company campuses, uh, they're closed off to the public except for this uh, building, which is uh, intended to be one of the all, only buildings that are open to the public, so that uh, employees, but also um, uh, some of the people that are endorsed by Adidas and guests can sort of meet under the same roof. So we try to actually do that. We try to sort of design something as simple as one uh, floating roof uh, to ensure that everybody meets under one roof, or one sort of, you could say, covered uh, public space. Uh, and we try to uh, recreate that, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, you could sort of say the uh, historic uh, or um, iconic uh, uh, stripes of Adidas with their sort of their sawtooth fringe and the lines into this roof. Uh, that actually is also uh, 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 with this very pronounced saw truth. Um, uh, and basically it's a, a, a floating roof uh, covering roughly uh, 11,000 square meters in one level uh, that's supported by these uh, black concrete slabs. Um, sorry, there's not so many images from the inside, um, uh, but um, here you can sort of see the overall idea of the roof. It's a very, very deep um, uh, building. Uh, and this means that actually the roof, it's uh, its not just a roof to uh, keep out rain as you would, but it's also full of daylight. So it also pulls daylight into the building. There's also cuts and holes for patios. Uh, it's a performative roof uh, also with uh, PE cells and so forth. So actually, when you somehow step into the building, uh, you have these uh, black concrete slabs that carry the roof, uh, and you have these vertical stripes cutting through the uh, building with all these uh, functions of both having a canteen, um, lecture halls, um, uh, spaces where uh, employees can sit and meet and talk. Uh, and actually, it's uh, sort of integrated into the landscape uh, as it sort of cuts upwards. So this is uh, the last image. Uh, uh, and I uh, just wanted to say uh, thank you for taking time out uh, to uh, listen to me. So thank you.